I saw this godly woman on the Facebooks the other day. She had like so many scripture verses. You poked her yet? I'm thinking about it. Have you Snapchatted her yet? Totally endorse her communication skills. Yeah, sure. Doctor on Twitter yet? Oh. You want me to ask her out for you? Would you? Yeah. Oh. Should I text her to ask her out? Send a group text. First date, I'm going to take her to my cousin's wedding. What do you think? Free dinner. Great idea. Should I ask her dad for permission to take her on a first date? What is this, 1950? Oh. Looked like a little bit of a friendationship was going on there. So a little accountability for those guys. What's going on? How are we doing this evening? <laughs> so Dallas, Fort Worth. Got folks tuning in in Houston. If you're listening around the world, we're glad you're with us as we move through this series called Save the Date. Save the Date. And so I thought I'd start here. It's fall. I love fall. Anybody else love fall? <laughs> Pumpkin spice lattes. Got to. And so... Uh, the, the weather starts to turn, like it's, it's tolerable in Texas, and, and fall uh, reminds me, it kind of, you know, begins to lift my spirits because I begin to think about my favorite time, which is Christmas. Love Christmas. And so I don't know if you guys do Christmas parties, but Watermark staff's Christmas parties are epic, okay? Epic. Uh, so I don't know what your Christmas parties are like. I'm confident they're very different than ours, but ours are epic. And so I just want to tell you about what this looks like. So Todd is like the king of fun. He's the senior pastor here. And, uh, and so we have some competitions and we're like all poor pastors. And so there's like losers and winners and the losers lose big. Like for example, the, the loser last year had to spend the night in a dunk tank and it was snowing outside and winners, winners win big. And so somebody will donate a prize. For example, all expense paid trip to Costa Rica, four seasons. Like we're not playing around. So you're win there's winners and losers. So it's like hunger games on staff. I mean like people, people die. No, people don't die. But, but it's like, but, but you go big. So I've had to do crazy. So I've, oh, I've never won but I've tried really hard, okay? So a couple years ago, uh, I had to bob for fruitcake in eggnog, all right? I, I mean, yeah, yeah, there we go. Scary, I know, I know. Uh, two years ago, I, I uh, was a human gingerbread man, okay? So they covered me in maple syrup, covered me in powdered sugar, uh, all kind. There I actually, that's after I got up and all the stuff had fallen off me. That's our Christmas party. We're not even drunk, okay? <laughs> Completely sober. Crazy Christmas party. But, but here's the deal. A year ago, I'm there, I'm with my wife, and he says, okay, you get to choose. You can go at this alone if you're on staff, or you can bring your spouse in with you and double your chances of winning but also double your chances of losing. What do you want to do? And I'm in this real predicament, okay? Because, you know, because Monica's there, and she's like, yeah, you know, we do double our... And I'm like, but, but wait a minute. Like, what do I... I want to... I need to know something. What do I need to know? What are we going to be doing? Like, is she good at that? Whatever it is we're going to... I mean, are we going to be doing something she's good at? Or are we going to be doing something... That, like, I need to know what the purpose is before I can choose if I want to go at it alone or not. Likewise, okay, as we talk about marriage and singleness, you have to first determine your purpose, why you're actually here, so you can determine, one, do you want to bring someone into that purpose to help you fulfill that purpose, and, and two, who do you want to bring? Like, who's going to help you fulfill your purpose? Who's going to help you do what it is you were put here to do? If I had something that I wanted you to accomplish and I said, hey, you can choose to partner up or go at it alone, you're going to first ask me, hey, what do you want me to accomplish? God didn't put you here on accident. He didn't like mess up. He didn't like forget what he was doing, like turn his eyes from the factory and all of a sudden you were produced. No, like he thought about you before the beginning of time. He brought you into this place, time and space to accomplish something very specifically geared towards you. And in the broadest terms, here's your purpose. I'm going to give it to you from the scripture. Genesis to Revelation, it's really repeated. To glorify God in all that you do. Now that can feel like big and ambiguous. But in broad terms, from the Bible, repeated over and over to glorify God 
in all that you do. Now, if you know that's your purpose, then you can begin to think about, hey, do I want to bring someone into the equation to help me fulfill that purpose? But it also tells you something else. If that's your purpose, to glorify God and all that, I want you to lean forward on this. Listen, I just told you why you have breath in your lungs, why your heart beats in your chest. You want to know why you're alive? It's not to, to get as many pleasures as you can, to build the biggest tower you can, to have as much stuff as you can, to be the most known, to have as many kids as you can. It's to glorify God in all that you do. And the beautiful thing about that purpose is you don't have to wait until you're married to fulfill that purpose. You can do that today, right now, as you leave here, when you wake up tomorrow, you can begin to say, okay, I've got so many years left. I'm going to begin to live my purpose to glorify God in all that I do. And so tonight we're talking about, as we move through this series, Save the Date, a dating series here at the porch, singleness on purpose. Everybody's favorite topic, singleness, yeah, everybody clap for singleness, we're here, we're talking about singleness, we love singleness, that guy does, uh, <laughs> thank you, David, um, and so here's the deal, let me like shoot you real straight before we dive in, disclaimer out of the way, I'm married, what does a married dude know about singleness, what are you going to teach, how are you going to empathize with, what, you think I forgot about it? You think I forgot what it was like to be single in Dallas? I was single in Dallas. I was looking for a spouse. You, you think, so let me ask you a question. Who is the most qualified person? Just because every time I go at this, Satan attacks me the same way. I've given this message or one really similar every single year because it's so important. And every time I step to the pulpit to give this message, Satan attacks me the same way. He says, man, you can't talk to them about that. That's not where you're at. They're not going to trust you. They're not going to believe you. And then every time I begin to dwell on those thoughts, the Lord just comes and says, bro, you are so qualified to talk to them about this from my scriptures because you lived it, you did it wrong, you did it right at times, you can tell them from the mistakes you've made. It, it, you know, who is better off to tell you something from the scriptures than someone who's never been there, never seen the next chapter, or someone who's been to the next chapter and said, bro, I remember when I was there, and this is what I wish I would have known. So let's dive in. This is what I wish I would have known. Tonight we're talking about singleness on purpose. I'm going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you want to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that's in the New Testament, Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. I'll set this up. Is it written about 56 AD? There's some really specific context going on here when Paul writes this letter. The church is under intense persecution, and the apostle Paul, being a prophet, knows that this is, this is going to be intensified, and he's right because Nero shows up on the scene, Emperor Nero, about 10 years later, where he takes persecution of Christians to a sport. Like, he has fun with it. He does it for entertainment. Like, he stitches animal skin to them and releases, releases rabid dogs, and dogs tear Christians apart, and people watch for entertainment. Like, it's a whole other level of wickedness. Well, well, Paul anticipates this. He knows that it's coming, and so he begins to write this letter. Hey, you need to get ready. And so I'm going to start in verses 7, 8, and 9. And what's beautiful is verses 7, 8, and 9 are really a preview where he opens up into a commentary there in verse 32. He expounds on these verses in, in verses 32, and that's where we'll spend the rest of our time. And so where I'm going to take you is the gift of singleness, the purpose of the gift, and why self-control is important when understanding this gift. So verse 7. I wish that all of you were as I am, Paul writes. Now, when he says I am, he's talking about his Facebook status of singleness. He's single. When he says, hey, I wish you were like me, he, he means, hey, I wish you were single like me. But each of you has your own, what's that word? Gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now, to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot, what? Control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So right off the bat, Paul says, hey, there's this thing that I have, it's called singleness, and it's a gift. The Greek word there is charisma. It literally translates the gift of God's grace. It's where we get the word charis, where the word charity comes from. 
and it translates directly grace of God. You have a gift intentionally. And so my first point is singleness is a gift. Now, now you're here and you're like, well, wait a minute. But how do I know if I have the gift of singleness? And I'm going to help you find out right now, okay? Every person here tonight, and if you're listening in your car, wherever you're at, Houston, Fort Worth, I want you to raise your hand if you are not married. Raise your hand if you're not married. Real high. Now, I see somebody. Oh, wow. Look, there's a lot of you. Wow. Okay. Lots of hands went in the air. Okay. If you're married here, you're outnumbered, evidently. All right. Here's the deal. You have the gift of singleness. Every single person who just raised their hands and those of you who were too scared to have the gift of singleness. Now, what did he just, did he just tell me that I'm going to be single? No, 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 no. Calm down. Okay. (laughs) Let your pulse go back to normal. Listen, you're single today. So today you have the gift of singleness and God says it's a gift. So today, this morning you woke up, you were not married. And so today you have a gift to steward. You have to gift given to you by God for God to do something with for God. That's what gifts in the scripture are. He's given you a gift and he's entrusted to it to you for him that you would steward it for his purposes that we would know singleness is a gift. Now I know some of you feel like it's the white elephant gift you got stuck with that nobody wants to take. You're like, <laughs> anybody want my gift? It's really good. And you're like, no, but, but listen, There are several wrong views of this gift in culture today. Two main ones. There's an Eastern cultural miss on this gift, and there's a Western cultural miss on this gift. And so let me explain the Eastern cultural miss, myth, uh, I'm sorry, miss first, okay? This is how the Eastern culture uh, has completely botched this gift. They come up and they say, hey, you are nothing unless you're married. The greatest goal in life is to get a family. That's your legacy. Without a legacy, you have no memory. So as soon as you effectively and efficiently can, you need to convince someone to marry you and start a family. Because without a family, you're nothing. Now, some of you came from this influence. This influence has actually leaked into some Western influences. So maybe you return, you go home, you know, for Christmas, and mom or grandma's like, I mean, don't, I mean, doesn't anybody like you? And you're like, oh, thanks. Thanks. I mean, do you not want to be married? You know, you're like, hey, mom, it's not really up to me. It's like, hey, I mean, come on. I mean, aren't there any nice guys or aren't there any nice young ladies where you live? And you're like, dude, get off my back, okay? And so then you don't go home anymore. I get it, okay? (laughs) The Western culture error or or the Western culture miss on this gift is that this life is to create an empire. It's all about you and the pleasures that you can absorb and the securities that you can surround yourself with. You are building a tower to you of which a spouse or a family is simply a brick in that tower should you choose one. If you don't need one, all the more power to you, okay? But if you want one, get one and it's an accessory. Just make sure that you can afford one Make sure that you're completely independent first, that you have everything that you need and that you have built this tower of money, a resume, possessions, successes, ambitions first. And as long as you find the right one, you can add them to the list. And that's also a miss. It's untrue. It's unbiblical. It's a terrible way of thinking and living. And so the result of the Eastern error is that a spouse is necessary for survival. So you actually get married to survive financially in that world. And and the, the, um, the, the result of the Western culture error is that you don't get married until you can afford to. That, that marriage is this very exp- expensive accessory, that it's a wedding, you've bought into this lie, this culture that you live in, and so until you can afford it, you don't even think about it, and they're both wrong. Because God says singleness is a gift. He says marriage is good, but he says singleness is good too, and he has purposes in it. He has something you want to accomplish. And so what are good reasons to be married? We covered this last week, just as a review, because God says it's good, because it is a strategy to make disciples by raising children in a family unit. 
and because it is a picture of God's commitment to us, a metaphor of Jesus and the church, our bridegroom married to his bride, the church. God invented marriage and he invented it to teach us something about him and it serves a purpose. And so what's missing in that list of reasons? To be complete. That's not a reason to be married. There's no Jerry Maguire theology here. It's that you don't need marriage to be complete. Let me ask you a question. Was Jesus complete? I mean, was Jesus not the most complete human being ever to walk the face of the planet? And was he married? No, no, God, when he wanted to be fully effective as a human, remained single. Jesus was single. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, yeah, but he was also God. Did, did the apostle Paul live a complete life? Yeah, he did. So did missionaries like Eric Little. So did amazing authors like C.S. Lewis. People that you've been influenced by. So did Mother Teresa. Amy Carmichael, who's a missionary in India, opened an orphanage, founded a mission, wrote books that have influenced tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Christians. Corey Ten Boom, who helped Jews escape the Holocaust, save lives. Katie Davis, still alive today, our peers, right? She saved the lives of 13 girls in Uganda. Are their lives complete? Are their lives more complete than yours? Are their lives more complete than mine? Why? What are they doing? What did they do? They used their gift of singleness. They saw it as a gift, not begrudgingly. They used it. They deployed it. In fact, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, okay, when he's going to come against the Nazi regime led by Hitler, and he has to recruit people into a seminary to teach them God's word, do you know he strategically went after single people? Because he knew that married people and those who had families would be distracted from this mission and tied down and unable to accomplish this grand call that God was calling him to. He lived a very complete life. Those who served under him lived a very complete life. And so regardless of how you feel, you must let God who created all things define whether singleness is good or not. Marriage serves a purpose. Singleness serves a purpose. Said otherwise, you serve a purpose in marriage. You serve a purpose in singleness. That's the gift you have today. That's the gift you received today if you raised your hand earlier. I remember when I was growing up, when Christmas was coming, there was a gift that I really, really wanted. It was a remote control car. Like one of those, have you ever seen with like the kind of gun remotes and the, the steering wheel here? You ever seen this? And, um, and so it was like this, this car, a specific car that I'd seen. It was really fast. My buddy had one. All I wanted was this remote control car. And so Christmas rolls around, I'd get up early, as was the routine, wake everyone up to my siblings' demise, and go under the Christmas tree, and we began to rip into presents. And the first one I opened was a hammer, and the second one I opened was this like set of screwdrivers, and the next present I opened was this like socket wrench set. But lo and behold, okay, I got closer and closer to this big square box, and I was like, I know, it's the remote control car. And I opened it up, and it was a toolbox. Okay, for all the tools I had received. <laughs> and I remember being so discouraged because I wanted some other gift. And you know what happened? I eventually got it. I got the car. The white remote control car. I remember it was fast. It was fun. I played with it every single day for about a month. And then the batteries died at one point. I put it on the shelf, never recharged it, sold it in a garage sale several years later for about 50 cents. You know, I still have those tools. Some of the tools I received when I was young at my parents' house, I still have them. I still use them. I didn't appreciate that they were useful, that they were good for something. And you know, with the tools, they're work. Like, like to use them, you have to put in work. And I think that an error that people think is, well, if singleness is work, I must be called to marriage. And then the error that married people make is, well, if marriage is work, then it must be wrong. I'll go back to singleness. Singleness and marriage, they're both a lot of work. They're both a lot of work. They're both gifts. 
And you have one of them today to use today. And one day you will regret not using the gift you have today. Because you're sitting there like a kid who didn't receive what he wanted for Christmas and pouting and looking into the future. And say, what's this for? What's this good for? I want that. And then married people say, what's this good for? I want that. And half of them, or more than half of them, go back to that. Do you see that? And so why does Paul say, now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do? And the answer is in verse 32 through 35. Let's go. Commentary on this passage. I would like you to be free from concern, Paul writes. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin, because if she's unmarried, it's assumed that she's a virgin in this text, is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, porch, but that you may live in right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Who, who doesn't want to be married to someone that lives to please them? Like my hunch is if you're here and you desire to be married, you want to be married to someone that lives to please you. And Paul says that's a distraction to their primary calling, living to please God. Them living to please you is a distraction to their primary purpose of living to please God. You're a distraction to their ministry. Don't find someone who's a distraction to your ministry. Find someone who's an asset to your ministry. Find someone who helps your ministry. Find someone who dives in with you and ministers with you in your ministry. And so my second point this evening is singleness serves a purpose. Singleness serves a purpose. It allows for undivided devotion to the Lord. That's what Paul writes. It allows for undivided devotion to the Lord. And so let me just, you know, this is where the whole married thing comes in handy. Um, this morning, I woke up to complete and total chaos. And here's what that looks like. You know, my son, Weston, sick with 104 fever at 5.30 this morning. He's crying out. We get up. She gets up. I support her as she gets up. And, uh, <laughs> and then my little girls come in. They're jumping on our bed. Then we get up. We begin to make breakfast. Monica has to run to the school to take a project that she helped the teacher with. I have to stay there with Weston as I wait to, to go to work. We're making breakfast for them. We're, we're doing that whole deal. And it really, the chaos really starts yesterday. I left this place about 6 p.m. And, and I leave here and I race through traffic to get to Finley's soccer practice. I go to pick her up. But first it's dad scrimmage. So we get out of the car, scrimmage the girls, then get back in the car, go pick up some Chinese food on the way home and then we just begin this race of okay okay uh, is homework done homework done okay homework okay you don't have homework yet you're three okay and so let's okay you, you need to do this. bath time for you you need can y'all take bath go other bath other shower okay all right come okay now y'all get in bed pajamas okay lotion all right you ready still have a fever oh no okay let's give him some Tylenol all right now y'all get in here okay bedtime let's say dear God please protect them and, and help them sleep okay now prayers with you okay I've got to write a porch message for tomorrow Hey, babe, I got to write a porch message for tomorrow, okay? Um, I have a feeling this is going to make it in there. And so if you feel stressed, <laughs> if you feel stressed, just wait until you have this little thing that the IRS calls dependence. Okay, because they're stress multipliers, all right? That's, that's what they do, okay? And so let me just keep hitting this home because he's talking about not being distracted and living in full devotion to the Lord. Do you know that since becoming a Christian, do you know that I've been to Africa, I've been to Rwanda, Kigali, I've been to Kenya, Nairobi, I've been to, um, do you know that I've been to the Maasai Mara, literally the African jungle? Do you know that I've been to, to the Brazil three different times? Go there into Manaus, get on a boat, travel for days down the Amazon River, get off in the Amazon jungle and begin to share people. I've done that three times, separated by months and even years at a time. 
And then, you know, I've been to Haiti four times, four different times, the island nation of Haiti, fly on a plane, get off the plane, get out, and begin to do ministry there. Go up into the mountains to tribal people, share the gospel, come down the mountains into the urban people and share the gospel. Go into Mission of Hope, to the villages, to the orphanage, to the hospitals, to the clinic, to the churches, to the schools, sharing the gospel. Do you know how many times, how many international trips I've been on since my son Weston was born? If you're listening, that's a zero. (laughs) He's three years old. None. Why? Because I've got this primary ministry that is now a distraction to those secondary and third ministries. I'm distracted. My attention, my devotion to the Lord is now divided. I have responsibilities. I have dependence that require my time, right? And and so everything begins to change. And so let me just say this real quick. The porch is going to Haiti. If you're here and a member here, there's not a single reason in the world that you shouldn't go. When we say unashamed, you need to be the first person in line. If you're here and you live in Dallas and you're single, you need to be the first person in line. That's using your singleness. There's not a single reason in the world you wouldn't go to Haiti with us and experience what God is doing there. You'll regret not going, I'll I'll just tell you right now. I I could go on and on. Sunday, I've gotta go to the Apple store, all right? I mean, torture, right? I mean, you know, you, you go there and you wait for hours, and I had an appointment, and you wait for hours, and so my phone's broken, so I'm like, I gotta go to the Apple store, Willow Bend, and so I'm just like driving around, I'm like, I'm gonna call, I need a buddy, you gotta go to the Apple store with a buddy, like, who wants to sit there alone for hours? So I'm like, you know what, I'll call Marshall, I can't call Marshall, he's got three kids, like his wife's not gonna let him go on a Sunday, and, and not because she's mean, but just because, you know, he's got responsibility, I'll call Simon, I can't call Simon, I mean, it'd be irresponsible for me to pull him away from his family, I'll call Mike, I can't call Mike. Sunday afternoon, they're about to go to lunch or about to start dinner. You know, I can't go, call Mike. He's about to sit down with the family. I'll call John. He's got a baby at the house. He's helping his wife with the baby. I can't call John. Who do I call? I'm going to go on Twitter and tweet, tweet to all my single friends. Anybody want to go to the Apple store? You know? He's like, what do you, you can't just, no, but you can't just up and leave. Do you know that in the past two weeks, and I'm not bragging, okay? I'm just, just laying this out for you. In the past two weeks, I've been invited to go fishing. I've been invited to go hunting. I've been invited to go to the beach. And I've been invited to go to Israel. Okay, in the past two weeks, and I'm like, nope, nope, no. You can't just up and leave. I can't just up and go hunting. I went fishing, honestly, but but I can't just, <laughs> I can't just do that, right? I can't just, hey, hey, Monica, I won't be home for dinner tonight. No, I'm gonna, you're gonna stay at home. Oh, I know it's a lot going on. The whole rat race. You got that though. I'm gonna go hunting. I, I'll, I'm gonna go to Israel for ten days. That's cool, right? No, I'm sure. Yeah, no, yeah, it's cool, right? You can't just do that. I can't do that. You can do that. Only for this season in your life. You can go to Haiti. You can come up with a thousand reasons not to go and cross them all out. Say, you know what, I can go. Why wouldn't I? I'm in. Why can't I go? I can totally go. JP can't go. I can go. I might be there. Here's here's the punchline. Your ministry should be more impactful than mine. I'm distracted. I've got these three little kids I disciple on a daily basis. You can have 30. Your ministry, according to this text, should be so much more impactful than mine, right? And this is why I do what I do, right? I mean, again, I mean this humbly, but but to show you my heart, I mean, I've been offered jobs, senior pastor jobs. I, I don't want to do that. I, I want to hang out with the most influential, impactful demographic of the church. Give me the single people. There's, that's who God's going to use to change the world. I, that's why I'm here. That's why I invested. That's why I'm not going to get to tuck in those three kids tonight. Because I want to be with you, telling you not to waste this season of your life. It's a gift, man. And it serves a purpose, man. 
You've got to go all in. You've got to wake up and begin to protect yourself from the enemy's distractions to you because now's the time to wake up and make a difference and do all the things that God, his Holy Spirit, has set in your heart that you dream about that you would not be distracted but focused. Say, God, I'm ready. I'm here. Take me. If I could go back and talk to my 21-year-old self, I would beg him to get after it. Do you, do you know to teach 1 Corinthians 7? I, I've got men who are employed by the church who sit over commentaries and come with illustrations and help me. I sit over the commentaries myself. I have to learn this text, the cultural context, so that I can sit up here and teach it to you. You know when Todd, senior pastor of Watermark, when he gets up here, he's just pulling from his 20s. He's just giving you stuff he learned when he was 16, 18, 21 years old. If I could go back and talk to my 21-year-old self, I would beg myself, hey, get out of the bar, get out of the club, stop sleeping around, deal with your porn issue. It's time to learn the Bible. Write it on your heart. Know it. Read it every day and do what it says. Now's the time to have full devotion, undivided devotion to the Lord. Are you concerned about the affairs of the world or the Lord? Your purpose as a single person is to be fully devoted to the affairs of the Lord, Paul writes. He says, I'd like you to be free from concern. With marriage comes real concern. Did Jesus not make the same exact point? Because some of you will be like, well, there's a weird cultural context happening in 1 Corinthians 7. JP, I've been to seminary. Listen, did Jesus not say the same thing, Matthew 19? They come to him and they say, hey, rabbi, can we get divorced for any reason? He says, no. You can't get a divorce. Have you not read that what God has brought together, let man not separate? Moses let you get a divorce because your hearts were hardened. But it wasn't this so. It wasn't so when God invented marriage. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, if we can't leave her, then it's better not to marry. And Jesus said, not everyone can accept this word. We know that. Not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs. We've got to explain that word. Eunuch is where we get the word unicorn. No, we don't. I'm just messing with you. No. Eunuch. Okay, listen, listen, listen. I'm sorry. It's a distraction. Sometimes that just happens. Uh, a, a eunuch is a single person devoted to celibacy. Like more specifically, it, it's a person who has no reproductive organs. It's a male who's been castrated. Now I wrestle with like, why is that in the scripture so much? And I believe the scripture tells us because it's a single person devoted to celibacy. Either something has happened to them, they were born a particular way, and Jesus is going to give us a third category here. This is the category I think very relevant to us. You ready? This is some eunuchs were born that way, single person devoted to celibacy, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, second category, and then this is us. Ready? And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The, the one who can accept this should accept it. Did you hear what Jesus just said? There are those who are devoted to celibacy and singleness for the kingdom of heaven. Okay, that's cool, Jesus. And then he says something crazy. Those who should accept or who can't accept this should. Do you see what he just did? It's like there's married people. That's cool. And then there's those who are devoted to singleness and celibacy for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And that's amazing. And you can be that person today. Now, I'm not talking about for your whole life. I don't know what tomorrow holds for you. I've got no idea. But today you've got the gift. So use the gift today. Today you have that gift, so steward that gift today. If your purpose is to glorify God and all that you do, start now because it only gets harder. Now what's the biggest distraction to living this purpose in singleness? What's the biggest distraction to living this purpose in singleness? Full devotion to the Lord. I'm gonna say it if you don't. It's sex. You want sex. I want to have sex. And I've been told that as a single person, I'm not supposed to have sex. Girls, you might call it companionship. 
Like I, I've heard that girls give sex to feel loved, guys give love to get sex, but it's sex. We want the accompany, like you're telling me that I, I might miss out on this thing that's so important to me called sex. Samson didn't miss out on that, right? Got after it. Verse nine says, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And then the commentary in verse 36, you ready? If anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorable toward the virgin he is engaged to, and if his passions are too strong, I just, I'm not, this is not a guilt trip at all, okay? If you know my story, this is not a guilt trip. But if you're engaged to someone, it's assumed they're a virgin here in this text. And if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then, ready? He who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does better. What? My third and final point this evening is singleness and self-control. Singleness and self-control. See, in the world of singleness, your only option for sex is celibacy. That means no sex. Okay. Uh, on Facebook, recently, someone stole a picture of my family from Facebook and posted this meme. And it says, this guy, meaning me, posts happy family photos on Facebook and tells gay people to live single and celibate lives. This was a person that I was ministering to and I thought we were having a great conversation and we had agreed to disagree on some things and I was really hurt by this just because it felt like, you know, I was trying to help him and, and then I got to thinking, I was like, well, it's true. I do tell all single people to live celibate lives. Jesus tells all single people to live celibate lives. The Apostle Paul tells all people to live celibate lives. God, through the Holy Spirit, authors the book, the scriptures, which tells all people to live, all single people rather, to live celibate lives. Let me say that in a different way. Tells all people to steward well the gifts they've been given for the kingdom. That, that's what it should say. This, this man posts happy fix, pictures of his family on Facebook and tells all people to steward appropriately the gifts that God has entrusted to them for his glory and his good purpose. And I do that unashamedly because I know that God, that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of heavenly lights. That God knows you. That he's intimately involved in your lives. There's nothing you've done he can't forgive you for. Nothing. He delights in forgiving you for the wicked that you've done as you turn to him and say, I'm going to follow you now. He delights in that. Those parties in heaven, it says, when that happens. There's nothing you've done that he can't forgive you for. And he's calling you to follow him right now. In self-control, guided by his Holy Spirit. And he's like, you want to sell out for sex and miss your purpose? No way. Because you thought sex was ultimate? No way. Use your singleness strategically to be devoted to the Lord. You've got these, these two options in life. You can use your singleness strategically to be devoted to the Lord, or you can make disciples in marriage. And he says, hey, if you burn with passion, then get married. I love that he says it. He, he gives you your options, very limited. He says, hey, you want to have sex? Get married. He doesn't say, hey, you want to have sex? Masturbate. It's a good way to relieve the stress. He says, hey, you want to have sex? Hey, when you're dating, go a little bit too far. Push the line a little bit. No, he gives you two. He gives you one option. If you burn with passion, get married. That's your only option now. Don't get married before you deal with some of the reasons that you burn with passion. If, if you've helped that fire through pornography and sexual sin. Guys, let me tell you something. I, I think you'll agree with me if you give me a chance. Sex outside of marriage has done more damage to marriage than just about anything I can think of. Sex outside of marriage 
has done more damage to marriage than anything I can think of. And here's why, because you gotta think about this. God invented sex, right? He made the parts, he made them function the way they do. It's his brilliant invention. It's like him and Jesus and the Holy Spirit were sitting around like, hey, we wanna bring babies, how can we do that? Holy Spirit's like, I don't know, man, they could say this word and babies could come. He's like, no, man, let's make it more intimate than that. Oh, I know, we'll take that and make that and make those work together like that and babies will be born. Oh, that's genius, Jesus. That's what we'll do. And, and he invented sex. I'm telling you, like, it was something like that. I, you know, it's not in the Bible, but it was something like that. <laughs> he invented sex. And it serves a purpose, it, you procreation, and it brings a husband and a wife together in a way where they have to act selfless toward one another in order to, to do that. Because sex when you're fighting is not fun, regardless and contrary to what you've heard, two people that hate each other don't have great sex. You have to love each other in order to come together in that very intimate act. And so what happens if you've been having sex whenever you feel like it by yourself? You get in marriage and you are selfish as all get out and you think it's just gonna be there whenever you want, but that's not how it works. The female body, okay, has to be loved and cherished and cared for to open up in that way. And so you get there and you're like, I want sex. She's like, I don't care what you want, okay? I hate you. And you're like, oh man, that's unfortunate. Um, <laughs> and, and so, right, like, and you're like, well, that's crazy, JP, that doesn't happen. Oh, does it not happen most of the time? Like you think those divorces, they just happen, like one day everything's amazing, wild, crazy monkey sex from the chandeliers, and like, I don't think I love you anymore. No, 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 man, those, those divorces represent long seasons of celibacy in marriage, which is much more difficult than celibacy in singleness. You tracking with me? Divorces represent long seasons of celibacy in marriage. That's celibacy with someone of the opposite sex naked lying next to you, cel celibacy. That's really difficult celibacy. You tracking with me? You guys following? Don't think too hard about it, okay? Just, just nod your head in agreement. And so do you see God's genius design? He's like, hey, you're gonna have to act unselfless toward one another, or unselfish, rather, toward one another so that you can come together in that act. And if you take that act out of what it was meant to be, you learn selfishness, a pattern of selfishness which ruins your marriage long before your marriage ever comes into existence. Why do you think marriage decline is directly related to people having sex outside of marriage? Sex outside of marriage goes up, marriage goes down. Sex outside of marriage stays down, marriage goes up. So the, see the video we saw last week. Now tell me God's not brilliant. Tell me he's not so much smarter than we are. And then there's this topic, and I'll just hit this briefly, of sanctification. See, in marriage, you're sanctified through learning to get along. In singleness, you're sanctified through celibacy, learning to control your desires, yielding them to God. You're sanctified. You are made more like God by learning to control your desires. So to honor God as a single person, you need to know three things about sex. One, it's a distraction to his purpose for your life. Two, it is absolutely not ultimate. No one in the history of history has ever died because they haven't had sex. What happened to Mary? She's a virgin, man, just went. <laughs> Never happened. And three, it's not an option for you. Let's take that option, remove it from the table. Maybe an option later for you in marriage, not an option for you in singleness. It's not an option. And so if you have sinned in that way, you can be forgiven, but make sure you remove the temptations and use this gift of singleness to get well. Okay, I'm gonna give you five things and we're gonna end. Five ways to use this gift of singleness. You ready? Number one, if you've sinned, I'm sorry, heal rather from hurts and habitual sin. And I'm just gonna add one, ready? Just flat out weirdness, okay? You guys track with me? Like if you don't know how to pick up your clothes or like do the dishes or you have these weird idiosyncrasies that people don't wanna tell you about, like would you take some time to heal from that? Okay, like listen to them, say hey, help me. 
I, I need help in growing up and they'll help you so that you don't pull someone down in the act of marriage. So take time to heal from hurts and habitual sin. Number two, learn how to love. And so if every relationship in your rearview mirror has crashed and burned, you don't know how to love, learn how. Get a roommate. The dysfunctions of two roommates trying to get a same-sex roommate and the dysfunction of those people trying to live together because they'll tell you, hey, pick up your clothes. Do the dishes, help out every now and then, or they'll just ignore you for months at a time, right? But whatever that is, that working through that dysfunction will help you. I, I am firmly in the camp that no single people should live alone, okay? I'm firmly in that camp, all right? I remember Monica and I, right after we got married, uh, we went um, through this deal called Home Builders Group, and they begin to instruct us on conflict resolution, and I was like, man, I wish I would have known that. With my roommate, we wouldn't have fought so much. You know, I wish I would have learned how to communicate in that way. I wish I would have learned those skills and tactics, right? And strategies before I got married as a single person, right? Number three, serve. All in, man. What are your dreams to change the world? What is preventing you? Gosh, what is preventing you from changing the world and fulfilling those dreams right now? Do something crazy or just be faithful. Four, be discipled. Find someone older than you or smarter than you or both that knows one more Bible verse than you do or whatever that is and say, hey, will you teach me the scripture? And fifth, disciple someone. Find someone who you know at least one more Bible verse than they do and teach them the scripture. Spend time with them, explaining God's word to them. And so in summary, singleness is a gift. Be strategically single, live out your purpose, single or married, and sex is not available to single people. And just as I wrap up, I just wanna say this, that I know there's girls that have been here that have dreamed of getting married since you were four years old. I get it. I mean, I got, I got a girl, I got two girls at home, six and eight. Finley came home yesterday singing, you know, that, that um, you know, Finley and whoever sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. She actually goes, Daddy, does K-I-S-S-I-N-G spell kissing? I knew where she was going with this. And, uh, and I just get, I feel the, the pressures on the world, of the world from her at six years old to get married. Like, this is crazy. And so I know that, that some of you have felt these pressures since you were four years old to get married. And, and, and there's, there's this, it has to be running through your mind right about now, like this whole message, maybe you tuned me out one time, you're like, hey, JP, you know, it's not exactly up to me. Like, I'd love to move from this life stage to that life stage, and I'm thinking about that, and I'm looking at this gift, it doesn't feel like a gift, I want that gift, and, and I don't even know if that's ever gonna happen to me. But guys, here's what I know, man, you're here this long. And then you go somewhere, and I want to show you something that God says to people who were single and celibate and used their celibacy for the kingdom of God. You know, he says this in Isaiah 56, verse 5. He says this, for this is what the Lord says to those who have lived celibate lives, who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. Listen to them. I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. You want, you're like, I was born to be a mom, JP. Do you think God doesn't know you were born to be a mom? He says, hey, I will give you one day much sooner than you think something more valuable than sons and daughters forever and ever and ever. There's no family up there, you know that? The only family in heaven is the family of Christ. This is who my brothers and sisters are. Remember, they come to Jesus, hey, your mom's here. What are you talking about? This is who my mom is. There's no family up there. There's no, there's no husbands and wives up there. I'm gonna get up there and Monica is gonna be a friend to me. I mean, that's crazy to think about because in the kingdom, he reprioritizes everything. And he says it's about us and the family of God and him. And I just, I want to tell you this. Friday, 
Friday was our wedding anniversary. We've been married 11 years. 11 years, man. It's crazy. Over a decade for these three kids. It's like uh, sometimes I feel like I'm playing house, you know, like I have no idea what I'm doing, but just figuring it out as I go along. And, and whenever you cross a boundary like that, a mile marker, like an anniversary, you sit back and you reflect. We look back on the 11 years, it's been a crazy 11 years, and, and honestly, it's gone up and to the right, man. It's, it's cliche, but I wrote in her card, I said, I know it's cliche, but this has been the best year ever. She's changed so much, I've changed so much. She's become the godliest woman I know. I'm not just saying that up here, I mean, it's true. I really, I thank God for that when I'm all by myself. I mean, her body's changed. She has this scar right here, big scar, where our three children were cut out of her. I love that scar and everything it represents. I love her so much. But as we reflect on the past 11 years, we looked at our biggest regrets we said the same thing. There weren't in the past 11 years. They were the 11 years before the 11 years. We were both so grieved by how we wasted those seasons of our life, by how we stewarded something that God said was a gift, and we used that gift for our own selfish pleasures and desires. We created habits in our lives that did not go away easily. I mean, they have taken 11 years of faithful sanctification in the work of the Holy Spirit to learn to live with each other in a selfless way. And so this, this is why I've given my life to this ministry. I don't want to do anything else. There's nowhere I'd rather be than right here in front of you begging you to stop playing games and wasting your singleness. You don't lose if you remain single. You lose if you waste your singleness. There's no better time than to create a place that Jesus would return to with every gift and every talent and every dollar and every possession and every relationship and every occupation and every training and every skill set and anything that you've received along the way. There's no better time to take all of that and say, here you go, God. Let's go. I'm not waiting for something else. What do you want to do with me? Where do you want to send me? How do you want to use me? Who do you want me to share with? Who do you want me to pour into? Who can pour into me, God, to make me a more effective warrior for you? God, if you bring someone into my life to live out my purpose with, praise be to you. And if you don't, I will live in full devotion to you until I die until I leave this place, if I'm 80 years old, 90 years old, 100 years old, I will serve you with every minute you give me in full devotion to live out my purpose, to glorify you in everything I do. What else are you gonna do, guys? What else are you gonna do? Get rich? Explore some Pleasures that you know you feel guilty of five seconds afterwards? You can get drunk again? You can keep partying. Snort another line? Slam another shot? What are you gonna do, man? You're gonna keep playing games? You're gonna keep wasting your life? Are you gonna go in? Go all in. Let me pray that you would. Father, I don't know how much time we have, but would you take whatever it is? And Father, would you use it for your good purpose? Father, would you use it for your glory? God, would you help us to see that whatever you've entrusted to us for whatever season you've entrusted to it to us for, would you help us to see it as a gift, Lord? 
Would you give us hearts of gratitude that we would deploy those gifts as, as others, the great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us and deployed those gifts so well? God, would you help us to use whatever talents you've entrusted to us? If it's two talents, if it's five talents, if it's ten talents, God, help us to see it and multiply it, to double it. God, would you change the world through my single friends in this room? Every hand that went in the air, God, I pray that they would lose the mindset that they're in a waiting room, a holding tank, waiting for something, some other season to be effective, that they would see today, God, please help them see today as their most effective days of ministry, that they would give their lives back to you and say, here I am, Lord, use me. Father, you are our shepherd and we are your sheep. Would you guide and lead us according to your good purpose? If you're here and, and you feel like you're single and forgotten, or maybe you're here and you look back and you see all this sexual sin, this like stuff, you know that you're like the woman at the well who's like, hey, it's not my husband. He's like, you're right, you've had five husbands and this guy's not your husband. Or you're here and you've lost someone. Maybe you went through a breakup recently and you feel so alone in that. You're gonna love Jesus. Jesus always moved towards those people the widow, the, the survivor of someone in the grave, the woman at the well, the prostitute. Jesus always moved towards those people. He always offered those people fulfillment, completeness, purpose, purpose. And so he doesn't want your scraps. Right, he, he doesn't want this thing that you've added to your life, this accessory called Christianity. He doesn't want you to call yourself a Christian by a cross in your neck or in title. He wants your everything, it, 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 full devotion. He wants you talking to him when you're all by yourself and no one can see you talking to him so you're not at all tempted to be prideful in what you might pray even out loud. But when you're in your closet, when you're by yourself in your room, that you would go to him and you'd beg him and you'd plead with him and you'd pursue a relationship with him harder and faster and more than you've ever pursued a relationship with anyone because everything wrong you've done, he paid for on the cross. He literally wiped your slate clean so that when God looks at you, he's no longer counting your sins against you because he understands they've been paid for through Christ. His death and resurrection is forgiveness for your sins. We, if we can help clarify that or simply pray with you that you would believe that, there's gonna be red shirts all over this place that would love the opportunity to do that. If you don't know what full devotion looks like for you, red shirts all over this place. If you wanna go to Haiti with us, you go to that Welcome Center, you write down, I wanna go to Haiti. Your email, we'll follow up with you. We're gonna take about 100, 150 people of you, 150 of you with us to Haiti. And we're just gonna do more in Dallas of what we do there. We're gonna change the freaking world for the cause of Christ. That's what we're gonna do. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.